Hey friends, and welcome to another episode of She Slays the Day podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lauren Brunslick, and today we are talking about boobies. It's a booby episode. Well, okay, so more specifically, like barriers in breastfeeding, boobies, barriers in breastfeeding. How much more alliteration can we, how do we get tongue ties and lip ties in there? Boob, boob, I don't know. All right, I'm going to give up on it already. So um, before we jump in, I have to tell you kind of a funny story that, so today I have Dr. Steph Libs on and she's cool. She like definitely, um, woke up the little like Enneagram seven in me because now all of a sudden I want to do lactation, the lactation course, um, and learn how to become a lactation consultant. But prior to that, I was listening to a podcast this weekend called Ologies. If you don't, if you've never listened to it, it's by Allie Ward. And basically it's the study of things. So like ology means the study of or something like that. And um, I was listening. I listened on bears. I listened on cicadas. I had a long drive. Um, What else did I listen on? Lots of things. Um, Normally I listen to morbid when I'm on a long drive and like to brush up on my true crime. But some of the people in my car were not fans of listening about brutal murders and drownings and things like that. So we turned to a more learner-oriented thing. One of the episodes we listened to was on taxidermy. Okay. I know I joke about how like every, like I'm always like on to the next thing, but it's been a while since I've done a new thing. My most recent thing was probably maybe the Peloton and now I'm obsessed with the Peloton and I'm not running as much. Um, but it's been a minute since I've gotten like blinders and really gone down away. So this taxidermy podcast episode made me legit get interested in learning taxidermy. Now, I don't think I'm going to do it this year. My kids are a bit young. I got a lot on my plate. I, uh, you know, would maybe need to have a little more time. Um, But, you know, I could see as my kids become like teenagers and they don't really care as much about me, um, I could totally see going down the rabbit hole of taxidermy. Now, some of you might be wondering, like, Lauren, you live in northern Wisconsin. Are you talking about like you know, like deer heads? No, not necessarily. Um, I think I would definitely try a couple deer heads, but I don't necessarily think that that would be where I would like really go. Um, I think that more so I would like to get into the birds aspect, like, oh, taxiderming a, a, a swan or a duck. You guys, I would ethically, I would only get the ones that were ethically killed, okay? I wouldn't be going like and murdering people just to stuff them. Also, you should know that when you're talking to a taxidermist, saying the phrase stuffing is like, it's like when people say like, will you crack me or something like that. Um, It's like apparently very painful because they do not stuff animals. Um, And yes, if you were wondering, we did have cadaver lab and I was totally into it in chiropractic school. So I'm, yeah, I'm going down this rabbit hole of like, there's this course. So the person she had on was Alice Markham. You can go follow her on Instagram. Uh, Just in case you're like, Lauren, you're crazy. No, go find her on Instagram. It's A-L-L-I-S. And look at some of her beautiful bird things. And you can take a three, what, what's you, four and a half hour course for $60 virtually. I'm assuming that you need to have like your own bird and probably like your own scalpel and probably like your own acid and all this other stuff. And as I was, you know, telling Kirby and my staff that like, this is my new thing I'm going to get into. Of course, they immediately went, well, you should have bought that autopsy table from a couple episodes ago. And I was like, damn it. You're right. Okay. But now my whole point in telling that story is now I think before I become a taxidermist, I might look into becoming a lactation consultant because, I don't know, Dr. Steph, like, kind of has me convinced. So Dr. Stephanie Libs is a pediatric and prenatal chiropractor in San Diego. Um, And after her own breastfeeding struggles, along with so many families in her office struggling, she quickly has become the breastfeeding doc. 
As a self-proclaimed education addict and book nerd, she finally enrolled in a program to become an international board certified lactation consultant. We talk about it. It's like 90 hours and I think it's totally doable. In 2021, she launched a course for chiropractors to learn more about taking care of breastfeeding moms and babies. Since launching courses for chiros, so many moms have reached out asking if they could take the course too. The Infant Adjusting and Breastfeeding Assessment course is just for chiros and chiro students, but this did inspire her to create a brand new course for moms with everything they need to know to breastfeed. Coming soon, it says. It's like having a lactation consultant in your pocket. She loves chiropractic and our philosophy even more that our innate intelligence is the guiding force in our bodies to adapt and thrive. She's been published in magazines, submitted case studies for peer review publication, and also hosts continuing ed workshops and chiro philosophy meetings. So, you know, chiropractic is kind of her jam. Whether you're a chiro, a mom, or both, these courses are created with intention, honor, holistic care, and a whole lot of love. And um, we will include in the show notes, if you are interested in checking out her course, more. So before we jump in, though, we are going to do a listener highlight. Um, And this one, here we go, where is it? Um, This one's from Dr. Whitaker, and it says, I'm a recent grad and have been struggling for the past few months with multiple things. I'm a mom of two young boys, started up a whole new business, dealing with insurance, patients, and mom guilt. I grew up Christian and have been and have fallen away along this journey. Your podcast has talked about so many things that have been weighing on my heart, especially student loans. Yes, that is today. Oops, Kirby's going to get mad at me. He told me, he's like, hey, sometimes you get really excited and you talk loud and it's hard to edit. So sorry about that, Kirby. Um, But yes, yes. Uh, The student loan episode is still the number one downloaded episode um, that we've done. We've done two. Um, They're completely different, okay? So just like little side promotion note here. Uh, Because I was just at a retreat the other day, a couple weeks ago, and I was talking to some Kairos about their student loans. I mean, they were talking about their student loans. I wasn't really... And they were talking about how they're not really sure what they should be doing right now because things are still on hold. And I was like, you need to go listen to the episode with the student loan specialist. Like, it will absolutely change your thinking on on paying back loans because what they were picking up on is basically they feel like there's a right thing to be doing right now and a wrong thing. And... That is true, uh, according to the like student loan expert. And it really depends on how much money you're making. Like it is, there is one route to go one way and one route to go the other. They are polar opposites and you can waste a lot of money if you do decide the wrong one. So Kirby will include in the show notes um, what episode number it is. I always forget. I think it's like 75 or something like that. But it says like student loan expert, go listen. And then if after listening, you realize that you are not in the group, that needs to like slow play this game and that you are going to get screwed unless you aggressively pay these off, then go listen to the even older episode where Kirby and I say how we paid off $175,000 in five years. So with that, let's pray um, and we will get into this awesome conversation with Dr. Stephanie Libs. Dear God, why, oh why did you make something so good and natural, like breastfeeding, so freaking difficult. Um, I don't know. I love you. And I'm not saying I could do your job better. I swear you did great. There's got to be a method to the madness. But if, if we could just have more support, more talks about how hard this is, more women coming forward and being vulnerable and sharing their story about why it's hard and like what they can do and just more guidance. Um, I know in my small town, we are getting further away from more support. It's actually going the opposite. So um, with such a beautiful thing like breastfeeding, help anybody who's like, yeah, I'm kind of into breastfeeding. Like maybe go get their certification, become a lactation person, like whatever, you know lactation person um and be with moms who well, chiropractors are not who are just struggling and crying i cried so many times because of how hard breastfeeding was um with our second and it just it, then comes the shame cycle and all of that especially as chiropractors where we feel like we need to just do everything holistically perfect and be there 
for our kids and when, when we start feeling like a failure. So be with the moms listening, be with the chiropractors listening, and, um, you know, just can you help ease the path a little bit? In your name we pray. Amen. All right, crew, here is a conversation on boobs and lactation and um, tongue ties and lip ties and all sorts of things with Dr. Stephanie Lips. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Thank Steph. You. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What's that? Have you listened to the podcast before? Yeah, I listened to that one episode um, about interviewing your your potential CA. Ah, uh, yeah. So oh you know God. that it's full of tangents <laughs> and random stories, and um, we get we get there somehow. I love it. I love it. I listened to that the other one um, <clears throat> with the doc who has a boutique practice. Oh yeah, that was interesting. That. Yeah, Very that blew my mind because yeah. I, I'm. I, I like to get away. I'm, I like to say I'm very woke. I'm a young millennial. Or I'm actually an old millennial. Um, <laughs> but like, I like to get away from like boxes, but so let's just for this conversation sake, say I, I would consider I'm high volume. Right. Um, right. You know, we run three to five minute appointments. Yeah. And yeah. we're like pretty, I also want to get away from the phrase straight chiropractic. Cause it's also limiting. It's also weird. And like uh, uh, saying like, I'm a straight chiropractor. And it's like, well, wait, I am straight. Cause I'm not gay, but I also mean a different thing. <laughs> so anyway, it's a so weird it was a term. Weird, yeah. It's a weird term. It's outdated. So, so um, it was a very eye-opening conversation for me where I was like, you spend how long? And then like, how much do you charge for that? And yeah. So, but I also come from a small town where the median income is $44,000. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, oh. But yeah. Sometimes. Well, good. So you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. Yes. Yes. I hope so. Boobies, boobies and milk and all those. Yes. Things. Let's talk about those boobies. Okay. <laughs> so give me the 411 on, I know you live in San Diego, you just mm-hmm. um, but like, tell me who you are, kind of where you're at in life. How'd you get to this point? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, so I practice in San Diego and, um, I specialize in pediatrics and pregnancy and have done all the ICPA training and, um, have all the certifications and all of that. And I always knew that's what I wanted to do. I went to life West and was very influenced by Jeannie Ohm. And, um, you know, I just knew that that was going to be my path. So <clears throat> when I graduated from life West, um, a little over eight years ago now, I just branded myself as a specialist in peds and pregnancy. And, um, I I'm wasn't... not allowed to do that in Wisconsin, by the way, which is, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. So side note, we'll get back to your story in a second. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in Wisconsin, so I have the letters, you know, the ICPA letters, yeah. uh, in Wisconsin, you are not allowed to imply that you are better than any other chiropractor for any other reason. And I'm just like, but I have extra letters. You know, I have extra letters. You are not allowed to say you specialize. You are not allowed to say you imply you are better. We do it all the time. We break the law all the time. I can't believe yeah. we haven't been reported. But yeah, so anyways, yep, you specialize. That is crazy. That is so crazy to me because I feel like you work so hard for that and you mm-hmm. should. And as, as a member of the public, I would want to go to a specialist. Mm-hmm. Duh. Oh yeah, Wisconsin. <laughs> we're, just, we're just funky over here. But anyways, That's crazy. go ahead and keep going. <laughs> so anyway, um, <laughs> so I was very influenced by Geniome. Um, I was also very influenced by Arnaud Bernier and did a lot of um, his MLS adjusting training. So that's kind of my practice style um, is like peds and pregnancy with an MLS influence. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I just started seeing lots of babies and pregnant moms and you know, pretty quickly my practice grew to that. And I have to say, I, so I branded myself as a peds pregnancy expert, but I, I was still learning, you know, yeah. like, cause I did mean, you start up right after, when did you graduate? 2013. Okay. And so yeah. did you start up right after graduation? So I actually started as an IC. Yeah. I started two weeks after I graduated and, um, my in-laws are chiropractors. My husband is not a chiropractor, but my in-laws are. And so I started at their practice and I um, started as an IC, just building a practice there. And I was there for two years and again, branded myself as a specialist. And so I really grew as that. And um, 
after two years, two years to the day, I moved out and started my own practice um, in the same town. <laughs> so that was kind of weird. I was going to say, awkward. <laughs> we had a family dinner and I was like, so sorry, but I'm going to move out. Um, <laughs> so, but it's been great. So I've been in my own space now for six years and um, have really just continued to build and have hired two associates and have a staff. I'm probably going to hire another associate soon. Um, and have really built the practice of my dreams of, of now I just see peds in pregnancy. Um, so like when no dudes allowed, like, what's that? No dudes allowed. Definitely. No dudes allowed. <laughs> no, we, well, you guys I, see moms though too, dad. right? Like, so that's what I always wonder when someone's like, I only see peds in pregnancy. So I'm like, so, but what about somebody who's trying to get pregnant? So, yeah. So at this point, because my practice is just so full. Like my schedule is just packed. So um, for, as far as new patients, I will only take on people who are pregnant currently or a baby. Um, and then any of my trying to conceive people will go to my associates. And, um, but I will take the dads of someone I'm already seeing because I do a lot of family plans. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to exclude the dads. So um I like taking care of whole families. You know, I think that yeah. healing, I'm sure you feel the same as exponential when everybody's coming in together. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the dads okay. All right. <laughs> or some partners, dudes, some partners. dudes allowed, some dudes allowed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I have two babies as well. So, um, they are two and four currently. And, um, one was an intended home birth turned hospital birth. Um, and my second was born at home, but they are, my kids are two years apart and I breastfed my first. I continued to breastfeed through my pregnancy, my second pregnancy. Um, and then continued for a year after that tandem nursing. So, wow. um, and I'm still nursing my almost three-year-old. If there was a breastfeeding badge, you got it. <laughs> You know, am I allowed to curse? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I fucking hope so. Because I want a fucking badge. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a lot of work. It's so it's, much work. It's terrible. It's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't yeah, talk about it enough. So that's we why. We don't I, talk about it. Yeah. When I, when I said, I want you on, but I don't want to talk about like the roses and butterflies. I want to talk about like breastfeeding hard sucks. Shit. Yeah. And you know what sucks even more? Pumping. Mm -hmm. pumping sucks <laughs> the God. day I put my pump away I was like oh yeah <laughs> I'm over it so is that how you started getting down the like wormhole of breastfeeding specifically in the pediatric prenatal realm is when you started breastfeeding yourself or did it start before that yeah so I would say it started when I bre was breastfeeding um because I had a lot of challenges with my first, <clears throat> had a lot of issues. And then I started to realize, like, I was already seeing so many babies come in with issues. And I was like, I don't know, I'm just going to adjust you and hope you have support elsewhere. And not really knowing mm -hmm. what else I could do or what, or what else there was. Um, and so I actually, um, so... I took a couple courses with, um, well, I took one course with Elizabeth Berg and she is a chiropractor. I believe she's also a lactation consultant and she kind of sparked the interest to become a lactation consultant. And I looked into the training and turns out as chiropractors, we have all of the clinical and educational requirements. As long as you already work with moms and babies, and you can take the course and it's a 90 hour course. And then you get an international license and then you are a lactation consultant. So, so that's um, so interesting. Cause I feel like I looked into it before and mm -hmm. I am not a researcher and I'm not very good at it. Um, <laughs> and I probably hit like one stumbling block and I was like, ah, oh, okay. Another, uh, and it was something like you had to have all of this, like hours and hours of clinical experience but like the way I read it was that like 
basically I would need to be in a hospital working under mm-hmm. a lactation consultant. Yeah. So, um, the, the requirement is a thousand hours as long as you are working with moms and babies in a clinical setting, which chiropractic counselor, that's our office. <laughs> and okay. I, I called the licensing board like three times and I was like, I what, just want to is make this sure a national licensing board. It's international. Okay. <clears throat> it's an international thing. So, um, yeah, I called them. So like, I'm just triple checking, triple yep. checking. I am a chiropractor. I take these 90 damn hours. <laughs> Are you going to have me? my own office? I'm not in a hospital. Am I clear? And they were like, yeah. So I was like, great. So I'll take the course. Um, so going through that process, I, I, you know, just obviously got more education in breastfeeding and the physiology behind it and a lot of the barriers that we face, um, as families going into birth and breastfeeding. Um, and then I had this one, um, mom who came in and, um, we became friends. So we were close. Um, turns out she got pregnant with her second. She was coming in for wellness care. She was like dream patient, like came in every week, brought her whole family. Um, her husband and her older kiddo came in and she had like the most amazing pregnancy. She did so great. She had an amazing birth and everything was going great. Brought the baby in like day two, we adjusted the baby. Everything was perfect and beautiful. And then five months later, she messages me out of the blue and she had been coming in this whole time. So like perfect, ideal wellness patient this whole time. So she calls me and she says, I don't know what to do. My nipples are cracked and bleeding and it's so painful. I want to quit. I don't know what to do. This is like, she'd been breastfeeding for five months. Yeah. And I was like, what happened? Everything's been fine. You haven't said anything about this. And she was like, I don't know. It just slowly crept up on me. And I kind of just ignored it. And I didn't think it was a big deal. Um, but like now I'm just bleeding. And I was like, what? And I was like, come in right away. Oh my Let's God. Let's the baby. And, um, you know, she was a, she was an athlete type person. So do, she just like powered through it and she thought it would change and it didn't. And so, um, so she came in and meanwhile, I had stopped checking the baby's latch because she had some teeth coming and everything was fine. Right. Everything was fine. So I stopped checking it. Um, so I was like, come in right away. Let's, let's recheck her. Checked her. And there was a lip and tongue tie that I had missed. And all her, other I have watched so many damn YouTube videos and like <laughs> tried to learn like tongue and lip ties. And I'm just like, what? That's one. What? And then like, yeah, they're sneaky little buggers. They're sneaky little buggers. And the, I will say like, even going through lactation consultant training, it's not enough. Like there is, there is, I'm all about function when it comes to ties. And so I, I don't refer every baby for a tie revision. Like this baby in particular really needed it. And it was something we missed and she went and had the revision and then everything was fine. We kept doing work on her and, you know, did more oral work, um, and lots of cranial work after. Um, but you know, I missed it. And there, like, this happens all the time. And I think that the ties are such a, um, such a crazy thing. Cause they're either totally overdiagnosed or totally underdiagnosed, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what I see so much. There's not enough standardization in the assessment and the appropriate referrals for it. Um, and I, you know, I come from, I come from life West. I come from a very like vitalistic subluxation based background. Um, I'm like such a green book head, (laughs) you know? And so the last thing I want to do is refer a baby for a surgical procedure. Right. You know? Um, but of course, sometimes it is warranted. Um, but I do think that it's often overdiagnosed and over revised. And then it doesn't 
even help in the long run. We have a pediatric dentist around us that um, does the laser version versus clipping. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference? I prefer laser for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I, anytime that I have a um, mom saying like, oh, we're going to see them to see if they need a revision. I'm just kind of now it's been half, it's been for, for four years now. And I'm like, oh, they're going to revise it. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, oh, they're yeah. gonna like, <laughs> I have not had a single baby go there. That has not been like, oh, yep, there we go. Laser, laser. Um, but yeah. only about half of them, I would say in my very anecdotal experience with over laser people, um, yeah. is that 50%? It is wonderful. And baby goes on to have a good, healthy relationship with mom and breastfeeding. And then the yeah. other 50%, they're like, well, that didn't work. I'm like, I don't know. Totally. I would say, I would say the same. And I, I, I'm really lucky that I have a pediatric dentist here who she, she is more conservative where if somebody goes in and they don't actually need it, she will, she will turn them away and say, no, you're fine. Keep doing chiropractic and body work, whatever else you want to do. Um, but <laughs> there are a couple offices here in San Diego that will just revise everybody mm -hmm. and not only revise everybody that goes in, but also do the lip, the tongue and the two cheek revisions just for fun. Just for fun, just because they're in there anyway. Yeah. We'll might as well do it. it. We'll do the laser away. <laughs> so now that baby has four incisions oh. to heal instead of one or two, and it's so intense. And I was just watching this like little clip on Oprah's Instagram the other day, um, and she was she was interviewing somebody. I don't remember who it was, but he was talking about how vital the first two months of life are, mm -hmm. and how like in those first two months is um, there's so much neurological imprinting of what's going on that if we experience trauma or abandonment or anything like that, it, it stays with us for life. And so my thought is, okay, well, most infants, if they're getting revised, it's happening within the first two months, mm -hmm. within the, probably the first few weeks. And so what is that doing to them? If we're, if we're causing, um, trauma and then every couple hours we have to stretch and reopen that trauma i mean that is a lot for a mom and a baby to go through so i don't take it lightly when um referring for a revision because it's a really big deal for people it's not easy and a lot of parents are traumatized themselves by having to traumatize their baby mm -hmm. so so um, I'm going to age myself a little bit here. Um, so, well, no, I mean, you graduated 2013. I'm 10. We're basically, the yeah. Same. We're basically um, the same. So when I started 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, I would say, I mean, I, I don't even know that tongue ties and lip ties was something we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure. I mean, we were taught not the world is talking about it, but like as right. a pediatric chiropractor, as somebody seeing kids, nothing. it wasn't happening. And now it's like everywhere. So yeah. is in your experience and like what you've researched, is it that this is something that's becoming more common or like it's, you, they say it's been just as common forever and we're mm -hmm. just diagnosing it now. You know, that's a tough question because I mean, same, I've been in practice for eight years, so I don't know what it was like 20 years ago mm -hmm. when I you know, I wasn't checking mouths then. Um, but I do think, I do think that there's a potential nutritional component and a genetic component. So, um, like I know there is a correlation with the MTHFR gene mutation mm -hmm. for midline disorders. Um, and the, you know, the frenulum are in the midline. Um, well, you would just, for those that aren't aware of the curse word that you just I always call um, it the motherfucker gene mutation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So MTHFR, I can't say I'm an expert in it by any means, but um, I've tried again. That's another one of those things where I've tried reading it and I've spent a lot of time and yeah. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> Something about make sure it's it. folate, not I folic acid. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so as far as I know, I guess in just simplified way mthfr is the gene that um, helps us convert 
folic acid to folate. Um, but a lot of people are deficient in it. A lot of people have this genetic mutation. Um, a really good person to look up on that is Dr. Ben Lynch. I think he's a naturopath or a DO, um, but he wrote a book called Dirty Genes, which is really good. And it goes through like the top six or seven most common genetic mutations and how they present. And a, so a lot of people- Are you have, the type of person who was convinced you had all six by the end of the book? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can't read I about conspiracy one, theories or stuff like that. And I'm just like, fuck. Got them all. I'm gonna die. Great. <laughs> but the good thing is he teaches you how to clean your genes. Oh. Um, so it's, it's a good book, but he's got podcasts and stuff that make it a little more, I guess, simplified to understand, but it's still, that's like a whole confusing world. So, mm. um, so I don't, I don't put a whole lot of emphasis into that because I feel like, um, once somebody has a baby already, they can't go back and like change their nutrition and genetic makeup, you know, you can't go back in time. So we might talk about it going forward for future babies, but, um, but yeah, so, um, I think there is a genetic component. I think there's a nutritional component. Um, and I think it's all like pre-pregnancy. So it's funny. Cause you mentioned like, what if somebody's trying to conceive, I love working with people who are trying to conceive, um, because I feel like we can help them with a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but my associate docs do that. So, right. Yes. Covers it. They're getting that um, care. Just not right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So where were we? That was the M MTHFR thing. What were we talking about? <laughs> where were we? Oh, why I are tongue ties more prevalent? Oh yes. Why? So, yeah. So I think that's the thing, but I also think that um circumcision stopped being um or it became an elective procedure okay and stopped being covered by most if not all insurances so now there is one sex of humans who are are we're having this um surgical procedure pretty frequently and now it's not covered. So now we can do this surgical procedure on any sex human baby. Um, so <laughs> I it's interesting the how the time yeah. correlated with that. So I think that is a big part of it as well. There's oh, money and yeah. insurance and all of that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So so you talked about barriers to breastfeeding and mm -hmm. obviously tongue and lip ties and cheek ties, which I didn't even know was a thing until 10 right. minutes ago. Um, <laughs> it, would you say that's the number one barrier or no? Okay. So not. what are some, yeah. Like what would you say the biggest okay. barriers are besides that it, we've already decided it fucking sucks and it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. So um, I would say, the there are a couple big barriers to breastfeeding and i would say it starts with birth so um one thing that a lot of people probably most people get in labor is an iv right okay. simple iv no yeah. big deal it's just fluid well what that iv is going to do is it's going to basically plump up the baby, waterlog the baby. They're going to soak it up like a sponge. And we know the more fluid you get in labor, the more the baby is going to absorb. Okay. So here's what happens all the time. And I see this same pattern so often. If someone, if someone gives birth in a hospital, it's typically in a hospital, this happens. Um, baby's born and they take their weight at birth. And that baby is like waterlogged. Uh huh. In addition to that, mom had the IV too. So now her breast tissue is super plumped up and engorged, but it's not true engorgement. It's swollen from the IV. So now you have baby trying to latch. If you also had medication in labor, their reflexes are dampened. So they can't do the breast crawl as easily. So the breast crawl is this magical, beautiful thing. Babies have every reflex they need to literally crawl themselves to the breast and latch on themselves without assistance. 
Like they crawl at birth. It's amazing. If you have medication, which look, no judgment there. I did with my first as well. But if you have medication that does dampen their reflexes and their ability to get there. So then you need assistance. So then a nurse comes and shoves baby's head on your boob and says, there, baby's on, latch, pull their mouth open, get them open nice and wide. Great, they're on. But now you've got the swollen breast tissue. And so it's hard and firm and it's hard for baby to latch onto that because it's not soft and supple and I can't get the nipple back far. Mm -hmm. So then you have a shallow latch and it's painful. And then somebody comes in and just drops off a nipple shield and says, here, Mm -hmm. try that. And might not even tell you how to use it. Um, and then a day goes by and oh, baby is losing too much weight. They've lost more than 10% they were waterlogged. because they were waterlogged in that first 24 hours. They pee out that fluid, but babies lost more than 10%. So we don't want your baby to die. So we need to do formula mm-hmm. or maybe donor milk. If you're lucky at a hospital. Um, so they need to do formula and nobody tells you while we're doing this bottle over here, you have to pump so that you make sure you keep your supply up. Nobody tells you that. Maybe, no, they, and around not. here, they actively tell you do not pump yeah. because, because it will tell your body that you need more milk than you actually need. And I'm right. Like, Is that Would the problem do- we have? Is that actually <laughs> a problem? Like, I think the amount of women who are like, I have too much milk is a very small sector. And then donate it. Like yes. most of us are like, I need more milk. Right. So, right. So that always exactly. was going to me of like, you're afraid that the pump is going to tell my body that the demand is higher than it actually is. And that is a problem. Okay. So yeah. So we don't tell them not to pump. Right. Right. So, so now we have this brand new baby and someone's in the hospital and, um, you know, their baby's losing too much weight. I just had a baby in the other day that was born fucking 11 pounds. Whoa. And they're like the baby lost too much weight. And I was the like, baby. the baby's <laughs> I was about to make a pounds. joke about a baby going on a diet and realize like, that was a bad <laughs> joke. Don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> funny in my head. Got plenty of room. <laughs> Baby gets down to lose a couple of pounds. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so anyway, I I just see this pattern happen all the time, and then mm-hmm. typically in a hospital, there's not a lactation consultant. If there is, maybe they are they don't have enough time for everybody or Mm -hmm. they're overwhelmed or they're also a nurse. So they come from a very medical background and they think formula is going to save their baby's life. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I tell people a lot is get baby's weight at 24 hours old because the weight at 24 hours, if you've had an IV is probably more true to their actual birth weight. And then you can take the percentage from there. If they've lost a lot and they're not, thriving then consider some donor milk um formula i think should be the last option um but that that is a pattern that i see all the time and then people are just given such bad advice when it comes to breastfeeding especially in the hospital not only in the hospital it could be anywhere but um there's a lot of very bad inaccurate advice out there and then it's a struggle and especially the first couple of weeks are such a struggle. It's, it's, if it's your first baby, it is brand new for you and baby. Everybody has to learn how to do it. Even if it's your second baby. Yeah. You've done it before, but that baby hasn't. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's all brand new again. So there's just, there's just not enough support around breastfeeding. And so that's what I think as chiropractors, we can really fill the gap because most likely we are, especially if you're a P's pregnancy doc, most likely you are the first provider they're seeing, if not the only provider, and you're probably seeing them more frequently than any other provider. And so I just really think that we have such a perfect window of opportunity that we can help these moms and babies so much. And the other thing is, okay, so the IV is just one barrier to breastfeeding. Um, medication and labor is a barrier to breastfeeding. C-section is a barrier to breastfeeding because your milk typically doesn't come in for an extra day or two if you have a C-section. Because um, you are, have met, uh, like drugs in your system yeah, or you haven't triggered from, the right response? Yeah, I think so. The milk um, production is triggered by the release of the placenta. 
So okay. once the placenta is out, um, then that does trigger your milk to come in. C-section, typically your milk comes in in three to five, three days or so um, with a vaginal birth. With a C-section, it's closer to five. Um, so again, if baby's losing weight Oof, in those first a long days, times of wait for your milk to come in. Yeah, they're just getting drops of colostrum. It's normal to lose a little bit of weight. Um, so the problem is then when we have all these artificial things in our body that, um, make it seem worse than it truly is. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's just, there's a lot, um, a lot of barriers <laughs> that we have to overcome. Especially you talked about hospital. some of the misinformation, like what yeah. are some of like the bad advice or myths that like you see in here? So I would, I mean, I think the biggest one that I see often is the weight loss, baby's weight loss. If they lose more than 10%, then they want to supplement the baby with something. Um, I think that um, another big one is not pumping. Like if somebody is supplementing with formula, very often they're not told you need to pump if, like if baby's getting a bottle, you need to pump so that your body knows to continue making milk. If you don't empty the breast, then your body's going to think you don't need it. So it's not going to continue making milk. So I think that's a really big one. Um, I think the other thing too, is we're not given full informed consent about formula. So formula is not a safe product. It's not like there are so many, um, so many different measurable outcomes that we know that breast milk is, I mean, breast milk is the biological norm. So I think that we should refer to it as the biological norm and formula should be like the exception. Um, but the, I was just look, looking at stats on breastfeeding in the U S and 84% of infants are initially breastfed, but by six months, that goes down to 58%. Only 58% of infants in the U S are still breastfed. And that goes down even lower at a year to like 30 something percent, which is crazy. Cause I mean, the, the world health organization says we should breastfeed till at least two, mm -hmm. but most people wean early, earlier than that, which this is not a judgment thing. If any, you know, I, I'm, I truly believe that like we have to do what's best for us and our mental health and our physical health and all of that. And if somebody wants to wean earlier than two, okay, fine. But we should, but it should also... at least be a properly informed decision. Exactly. Exactly. We should know the benefits. We should know, um, you know, the risks of formula. We should know the risks of weaning early. Cause really if, if two, if age two is more the biological norm, anything under that really should be called early weaning. Mm -hmm. And anything over two is like normal. Um, so, but a lot of people don't get there and we have a lot of pediatricians who don't understand breastfeeding and they don't understand the benefits of extended breastfeeding. Um, well, so would you say that, okay, so I was able to breastfeed my first for about 15 months. I, I do remember having like, I don't know if it was full on mastitis, but like the onset of a like, oh, this is not good for like 48 hours, but I didn't need mm -hmm. antibiotics or anything like that. I was able to yeah. like, it's like getting cabbage and stuff all over. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I do remember like being in the middle of the night and Googling, like, is it okay if your baby drinks blood in the breast milk? <laughs> like, <laughs> is it okay? Did I, I ruin this breast too. milk because there's blood from my freaking nipple in it? And they're like, nah, just a little bit of blood's fine. You know, you remember like strawberry, strawberry kind of milkshake. Pink. You're like, oh God, that's disgusting. <laughs> um, but my second, you know, but also I had to go back. Well, I didn't have to. I, I went back to work at six weeks yeah. with my first. And, you know, we had found our rhythm by then. So I would breastfeed yeah. in the morning. I would pump during the day. Mm -hmm. I would feed her when I'd get home. Um, but even with that, I would say every three, two to three months, my milk supply would get less and less and less. Yeah. Um, and that was a big thing for me where I was frustrated where it's like, 
Well, they told me that my milk supply would keep up with her demands, like as the baby needs more. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's true if I was with her all day. Right. But I'm not. I'm at work and I have decided that I'll breastfeed at eight. I'll pump at 10 and two Mm -hmm. and then I'll see her again. And like maybe I can squeeze in a third breastfeeding session between eight and five or pumping session. Um, but like my body yeah. was like, that's plastic. That's not a baby. <laughs> um, so we were able to 15 months yep. of the first one, but then second, yep. I went back to work at five weeks. And during that time we had all sorts of trauma. Um, she was actually a, a great home birth. Um, and, but she developed a staph infection. So at like nine days old, she was, we were in the hospital. She's getting mm-hmm. IV antibiotics. And like, we're at this point, we're still trying to figure out breastfeeding. She right. hates my nipples. Like she was that kid that like, well, I know she had a revision or like needed a revision, but like, it was like somebody was taking just a piece of glass and just slicing every time. Oof. And I'm like, uh, so I know you're here to make sure she's not dying from a staph infection, but you guys have a lactation consultant because I really need one of those too. Yeah. Um, but I went back to work and oh, what happened is, is so three days before going back to work, we were finally getting our rhythm yeah. and we were latching. It was with a shield, but it was like, okay, we can, we can use the shield for now. Totally. Um, but then she like refused a bottle. She would not take a bottle. And I'm yeah. like, shit, I go back to work her. in three days. Oh. I do not have the liberty of like coming home because my baby's right. not eating. And so yeah. we're like, okay, we're going to focus on getting her to accept a bottle over the next three days. And she did. And then she was just that kid that was like, I will take the boob or the bottle, not both. And so yeah. I pumped, but because I was exclusively pumping from mm-hmm. at five weeks old, my milk supply just dropped just greatly. Yeah. And so by eight months, yeah. I think she was getting like two ounces a day. Yeah. And I was like, this sucks. This sucks. Yeah. And I feel like that's what so many women like, run into with weaning and like you tell me obviously but like it's kind of like well I'm spending more time with this pump than the baby yeah my milk supply I'm doing all this work I'm like checking out of meetings and like setting aside time in my schedule so I can pump and then I come home and I've got four ounces of breast milk (laughs) and I'm just going insane going crazy well and that's the thing like you know you said so many things there that like I could get on such a soapbox about. And so it, it blows my mind that we are expected to go back to work so soon. It's insane. Yeah, my boss is a bitch. (laughs) Mine too. God, she made me come back at like 11 weeks. This is maternity leave. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, I think that is such a huge problem. And I feel like, I feel like I'm an anti-feminist feminist because Um, I feel like, you know, the cool thing for like feminists to say is like, let's get universal childcare paid for. And I'm like, how about we fucking pay moms to stay home and breastfeed their babies? How about that? Cause Mm -hmm. that will, that will for sure create a healthier society for sure. It will create lifelong health, which will take a huge burden off of our healthcare system and make a, a huge impact on a healthier society. But, but how would that, I mean, that. realistically, how would that work with a self-employed scenario? You know, well, so exactly. like if you were getting paid, would yeah. you close your clinic because you're getting money from the government? And then right. like a year later, you gonna be like, hey right. guys, I'm back. Don't worry. Right. And they're like, oh, let's we rebuild. Had to go to another chiropractor. <laughs> Sorry, right. you took a year off. Right. So, oh, like, and then you have another baby. <laughs> How are you pregnant? We're so happy. <laughs> Great. Um, so it, yeah, that's, it extra that's sucks. The that's the thing as chiropractors, we're in a really tricky situation if we're self-employed, especially because it depends on us showing up and being here. So um, I hired my first associate when I was pregnant to take over. Um, and I mean, that was really a blessing because they were able to run things. Of course it took a huge hit because I wasn't here. And so, um, both times my clinics tanked by 40%. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's crazy because a lot of people don't realize this. Like we're in a really tough position as mom chiropractors because oh, we, and because also we are expected to breastfeed until they go to high school. Yeah. Yeah. 
we're expected to have home births after like running high volume practices and doing side posture all day long. <laughs> and then we're expected to breastfeed forever and it doesn't work. And so um, luckily with my second, I was able to bring him cause I had my associates. And so I could kind of like, he was a very chill baby. So I would just pass him to the next person and everybody would hold him. It was fine. And he, he was big fat baby. So he could wait on breastfeeding. <laughs> um, but my first, there's no way I could have done that. She was a super, um, high needs baby. Like mm -hmm. if I was around and not holding her, she would have freaked out. So mm -hmm. I did not bring her to the office at all. Um, so, you know, I, maybe that's where the boutique style comes in. <laughs> maybe that's better. You can bring your baby, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And then that sucks. Cause then it's just like, well, I don't want a boutique style. You know, it's like, so then I'm like, well, yeah. did I pick my high volume practice? Like, did I pick my practice? Cause I was like, oh, the numbers are tanking. I'm right going back to work. Um, right. So did right. I pick my practice over my baby? And I'm like, well, you know, those are all like the shame the shame cycle that totally we yep. deal with. And it yes, sucks. it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. I I'm in the same boat, you know, it's like, I, I came back to work at 11 and 12 weeks with both pregnancies. And the first time I didn't get any paid leave coverage through our state. I don't know if, do you guys have paid leave through your state? Like family question. leave? I don't think so. No. Most states don't. So yeah, I don't, think you know, so. I didn't get it. most states don't California. We get like 55% of our pay. So my second, I set myself up as a corporation and made myself an employee and I was able to get the state benefits. But when you have no income for, you know, six weeks. And I mean, for me, my vagina was still bleeding at seven weeks. I it mean, was? yeah, I, I'm a long bleeder. I'm a long bleeder. I mean, not like a ton, but like, you know, I'd go for a walk and like have spotting mm -hmm. at seven weeks. And so I'm like, there's yeah. no way I can go back into practice. My vagina, my uterus is not healed. My vagina yep. wasn't healed either. Yep. <laughs> Neither of them were healed. So, um, it's just crazy how we have such an expectation to get back to work. So I feel like if I were to run for president, mm -hmm. my platform would be yes. keep moms with their babies. Keep moms with the babies. <laughs> oh man, the feminists would come after you though. Oh, they would come out. I would Damn be it. burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. Yeah. Depending on yeah. my mood and my PMS, I might one day be at one of them being like, no, send moms back to work. Wait, never mind. <laughs> we need more women in corporate America, CEOs. Never mind. I know. Isn't, isn't it a tricky thing? Cause it's like, yeah, we do need that, but we also need corporations to understand that moms have babies and then they breastfeed mm -hmm. and they need a work schedule that is conducive to that. Yeah. And I think if I were like super, super like rich corporation, that's one of the things that I would do is like, yeah, have like a nursery. And it's like, yeah, you can go and feed your baby. It's yes. nice to spend other people's money. Like if I were rich, this is what I would do. <laughs> if I were rich, here's what I would do with your money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So if you have a mom, new mom who's listening or about to give birth, let's say mm -hmm. she has not given birth yet. What is some of the biggest advice you would give her to set herself up for success? What does success even like look like? That's a great question. So I think the, the biggest thing I would say would be set up your team. I think a lot of people, um, want to have a natural birth or a less interrupted birth, especially chiropractors. Um, you need to know what you're getting. If you're going, if you're planning a hospital birth, it's a lot harder to have a natural unmedicated uninterrupted birth. It's just harder. That's not what they sell there. They sell medicated, managed surgical birth. So I know a lot of people don't want to spend the money, but if you want to have a baby, then save up for it. Just like you did your wedding or your student loans or whatever it is. Like most people, well, I don't, I don't know about most people, but at least chiropractors can financially make it happen. So mm -hmm. um, set up your team ahead of time. Um, find the lactation consultants in your area that you know are more in alignment with maybe your practice style or a more holistic um, outlook of breastfeeding because 
there are plenty of lactation consultants that just want to revise and, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe aren't quite the same philosophy as we are. Um, and then if you're not a peds chiropractor, find one, um, find a pediatric chiropractor who can take care of your baby. Even me as a pediatric chiropractor, I had other people check my baby when she was first born because I was just in a haze and I needed other people to look at her. So, um, set up your team ahead of time. The other thing is, um, I think really prepare for birth and breastfeeding, watch videos, do as much learning and education as you can. Um, look up the breast crawl. It's the most amazing thing. UNICEF has a video that's out. Um, it's old, but it's like beautiful and it explains everything. Um, so, um, yeah, look up all of that stuff ahead of time so that you're not guessing when your baby comes out. Cause we do a lot of birth prep classes, but not a whole lot of breastfeeding prep classes. And so, um, I think starting there is really, it's just getting worse and worse. Like as far as it used to be standard in the hospital that does most of the births around us, um, that the lactation consultant, you would meet with them before leaving the hospital. And then one week later, you would have an appointment. And now they come in maybe and like everything good, like maybe if, you know, um, and the one week appointment is not scheduled. You can call and schedule it if you're having issues. And even then, like I've heard from our moms that they're like, a lot of times it's almost like they're trying to talk you out of coming in on the phone where it's like, well, what's the problem? Have you just tried this? Have you tried a shield? Well, why don't you try that and get back to us? And so then like that mom feels like, I'm sorry that I'm being annoying and inconveniencing you, you know, like, yes. And a lot of moms feel like unless they're having a major issue, they shouldn't ask and they shouldn't bother someone. They can figure it out, you know? And it's like, really, even if, even if everything's going fine, it it still doesn't hurt to get some help and have somebody Mm -hmm. just look at what you're doing and maybe give you a few pointers on positioning or, you know, just making sure the lips are flaring out properly, you know, just lots of little things that can help so much that we're just not told. Mm -hmm. So, and then as a chiropractor who Mm -hmm. is interested in pediatric and prenatal care. So like Mm -hmm. I took ICPA, but like, I don't know that I feel amazing with cranials. Like I do cranials in Mm -hmm. clinic, but like, is there like more cranial work that I should be learning? Is there, you know, the, what's the 90 hour thing again? Like, so what as a chiropractor can you do? So, um, well, I actually just launched a course for chiropractors to learn more. Um, so, um, I think that's a great place to start (laughs) if I don't say so myself. Um, So I created a course because I feel like there is a little bit of a gap between the ICPA training and breastfeeding assessment and latch work. So um, I created a course. It's an hour and a half long. It's all online. It's like self-paced. You can take it, you know, however you want. And it's 79 bucks. So it's like, it's super cheap. It's pretty affordable. Um, Yeah. So, um, cause I just wanted to teach more about this stuff and teach other chiropractors because, um, there is more cranial work to be done. There's so much that can be done in the mouth. So just by putting your finger in baby's mouth, you can feel the roof of their mouth. And very often it's the shape of the palate that is affecting the function of their tongue and correcting that can often help the latch and maybe a tongue tie revision is not needed, or maybe it looks like a tongue tie, but it's actually because the tongue is not moving because the palate is misshapen. So there's a whole lot more that can be, you know, checked. Um, and it doesn't take very long. Like you can still be high. I'm a high volume practice. I consider myself high volume and, um, you can still be high volume and do this work. It doesn't take very long. Mm -hmm. It's just adding, you know, a couple little steps or changing a couple little things and, um, getting better breastfeeding outcomes. And so now because I've been doing this, I've really become known as like the breastfeeding chiropractor. And so, people send me their babies all the time. Lots of other providers have sent me people. And part of it is because I got the IBCLC lactation consultant certificate. Um, but a big part is just because of the results. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. amazing. 
Yeah. Okay. So if somebody wants to find more information on the course or just follow you, where, where are you sending them? Great question. So you can find Instagram is probably the best. Um, Dr. Steph Libs, D-R-S-T-E-P-H-L-I-B-S. Um, that's me on Instagram. Um, I also have a website, drstephlibs.com. And there's more info about the course there. I have a free download too. If you go to my, um, Instagram. I have a free download. That's like how to become the go-to pediatric Cairo in your area. And just a couple of like business practice building marketing tips, um, that you can implement pretty easily. And then if you want the course, you can get the course too. That is awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I now want to go get my lactation consulting. <laughs> you should. It's fun. Yeah. So, all right. Well, she slayers go check out that course, super affordable. Um, like why wouldn't you, if you are into like helping your moms the most you can, even if you get like one nugget out of it, like yeah. worth it. Um, and until next week, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>